Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansen. Tonight, stories of horror and heartbreak from Lytton, B.C. Please! Please, God! I want everyone to please help us. He tried to keep his parents safe, but says all he could do is watch as the flames tore through. I went back up to the house and I was yelling and screaming at my mom. I said, yell and scream, Mom, Dad. And anxiety across the province as lightning strikes set off more fires. Also tonight, Toronto police mourn an officer killed in the line of duty. It, is a, it was a deliberate and intentional act. What we know about what happened and how he's being remembered. Filling in gaps in guidance, families navigate an increasingly vaccinated world with unvaccinated kids. For both my dad and my mom, the first thing they're going to want to do is, is, is hug them. Is it safe? And... It doesn't change the actual plans, but it certainly uh, changes the budget. Why your summer road trip is going to cost you. This is The National. As we near the end of a record-breaking week, we have alarming new figures to report. The toll from BC's deadly heat wave is greater than we knew. The coroner's office revealing that in the last seven days, sudden deaths in this province jumped to three times what's normal, to 719. And while the heat has eased in parts of BC, the danger remains. What the hell? Today, the toll from the fires themselves began to be counted. Two deaths have been reported in the devastated village of Lytton. Tonight, we have a first-hand account of how they happened. Once again, Susanna De Silva is just outside Lytton this evening. And Susanna, tell us about the man that you spoke with today. Yeah, he shared his very, very painful story today. Now, authorities aren't still confirming how many people are unaccounted for or exactly who they are, but the man I spoke to is certain that his parents were lost. Please help my mom and dad and my, and my brother and my animals, please. A video message Jeff Chapman recorded in case he didn't make it. I just can't get it out of my mind. I just, I, I cannot get it out of my mind. Chapman was getting ready for dinner with his parents when they spotted smoke. Minutes later, fire was all around them. I finally got one little spot fire out and then this one started and now our shed's on fire. The shed went up. And then there's a big tree above our house and it candled. And as soon as that candled, the whole house went up. Like the time I knew that there was, I seen smoke and knew there was trouble, I don't even think it was 10 minutes. And by that point, he says they were surrounded. His parents, including his father, who had trouble walking, wouldn't get far, he realized. So he got them to take shelter in a recently dug trench. I was always told, get down low as you can. I said, Mom, get down and get down. And she went down in. My dad come out. And he says, where's your mom? He's down in the hole and everything's just going right up. So my, my, my dad went down in there and there just happened to be a piece of tin or something there. And I slid it over and, and I almost went in with, with them. I hesitated and I went, I was not in the room. I just saw it and I pulled, it, pulled the piece of sheet over and I, and I ran. The only spot he could think of that wouldn't burn was the gravel on the nearby railway tracks. He lay there for 45 minutes waiting out the fire. I went back up to the house and I was yelling and screaming at my mom. I yelled and screamed, Mom, Dad, and I came up and I seen what was left of my mom. He says a power line had come down on them. When he realized there was nothing he could do, he got in his truck and fled. We just trying to save what we worked our whole life for. You know, that we're just trying to save what we worked for to have. You know, it might not have been the best, but it was home. He is still waiting for authorities to find his parents. They've been there for two days. Like, they, they, you know, I know the fires are still burning around, but how hard can it be to go in and we know, it's not like we don't know where they are. The coroner's office says it has spoken to Chapman, but it's not safe to enter the village. There's a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, hazards there at the moment, uh, dangerous chemicals, uh, gases in particular. Uh, so it is definitely not a, a safe site at this time. They're still laying out there. And that's the hardest part, knowing that. 
He says he's speaking out because he wants people to understand the human toll that these fires are taking. And while he doesn't want to blame anyone and knows that that day there was very little to prevent what happened, he does want to know if perhaps before that something could have been done to prevent it. He also wants to know the cause. For other families, they still have questions. They don't know where their loved ones are. For others, like the woman I spoke to yesterday, yesterday rather, she was able to find her loved ones. But you can see behind me some of the conditions they say are preventing them from going in. You can see the Plumes of smoke still billowing behind me. The wind is still here with their helicopters coming up and down, trying to drop, drop water on these very difficult conditions. Ian? Thanks, Susanna. And a reminder, officials are urging anyone who had to flee Lytton to register online to help find the missing and direct resources where they're needed. You can find it online here, ess.gov.bc.ca. Fire and fear are spreading in other parts of the province as well. And late this evening, people in another B.C. community are being told to leave now. Katie Nicholson is following the latest evacuation orders for us tonight. Katie? Yeah, so this is for an area around Durand Lake, just west of Kamloops. This order was signed at 7 o'clock Pacific time. It affects more than 150 properties. People there are being asked to go to the uh, MacArthur Island Sports Centre and register as an evacuee in Kamloops. That whole area around Kamloops, one of the ones of concern raised today in the provincial briefing. It's one of the reasons why, for many, it's going to be a nerve-wracking night. The roar of planes overhead cutting through the smoky sky. Below, bags are packed as fire once again threatens to move in on Kamloops. Just last night, 200 people were forced from their homes in this neighborhood. Dante Tamada took that video. Those flames were at least 40 feet high over the crest. Um, it was, uh, the kids were really worried, weren't you? You guys were really worried. Um, they were pretty upset. By all accounts, it was a close call. If that fire had jumped over and lit up those trees, Juniper would be done just like Lytton was. Those with homes have one set of problems, but plans are being made to make sure the most vulnerable also have a means of escape. We are still doing some groundwork to try and get those folks who have been sleeping um, outside, you know, to come to the shelters um, so that they can be included in that evacuation when the time comes. Hot, dry conditions have parched forests, trees now like kindling. 50% of fires in the province are started by lightning. Yesterday, there were 12,000 lightning strikes. The way the forest floor is right now, potential for ignition due to lightning is very high. Like, we're talking in the 80s and the 90s for most of the southeast fire centers. And that means little relief from anxiety especially for those in more remote areas like Decca Lake. Worried. I got everything here. I could lose everything. You know, I don't want to start over at 66 years old. Gordon Weiss's precious belongings packed in boxes ready to go. That's a lifetime of, you know, 46 years together, living together, right? That's our kids. That's our marriage. That's, that's everything. All in these boxes. That's what counts. That and a concrete plan of escape. Katie, a lot of people in B.C. packed, ready to go if they need to. And, and there's word uh, that federal help may be on the way. What do we know about that? Yeah, so pretty much since the Lytton fire, the federal government said it was here to help. And so today we got a briefing with the Minister of Defence who said military aircraft are staging so that there can be a base operating out of Edmonton. So should the need arise, those military aircraft can help transport firefighters and people who need to be evacuated, people who may be trapped by wildfires. So these things now on the table should B.C. request and need this help. Thanks, Katie. You're welcome. Once again this evening, CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is tracking the wildfire situation here in B.C. And, and Joe, what's the risk looking like now? Ian, we've got more thunderstorms firing up across the province, especially in the southeast where fire danger is at extreme. And already this is an area where we have several fires of note, several out of control fires. Uh, the center of sort of this swirling system that's bringing these lightning strikes slowly tracking towards the BC Alberta border. Uh, but we are seeing hundreds 
more lightning strikes and they're not all coming with that good soaking rain. The door is open right across the province to instability, which is why we've been seeing these racing winds uh, through the canyons and valleys. So next 24 hours, uh, more thunderstorms, possibly new fire starts. And the thing with the wind, Ian, it doesn't just uh, fan the existing flames. It just takes one ember to be carried away from a burning fire. It can move, you know, kilometers into uh, into the distance and start new fires. So a uh, very tense sort of next 24 hours. And Joe, as the heat has, has moved towards the prairies, are they gonna see the same kind of fire risk that we have here? Yeah, extreme fire danger on the east side of the Rockies. Uh, I'm really looking for that lightning activity along the border, so in the foothills, and then in northern Alberta, where there is greater risk of the wildfires. Uh, the heat is slowly starting to subside, but I should add, I was looking at some of the long, long-range models, and it does look like uh, the next couple of weeks uh, will be hot, and of course, uh, looking ahead to what could be a very busy fire season for Western Canada. All right, Johanna, thank you very much. And looking even further ahead, you'll be back along with a fire ecologist to talk more about wildfires in the West. Thanks. You're welcome. On to other news and a terrible tragedy in southern Alberta. An early morning house fire near Calgary has claimed the lives of seven people, four of them children. Allison Dempster shows us how quickly it happened. Scenes of immense grief in the small community of Chestermere as family and friends try to process the loss of seven people, including four children, in a house fire. We're just devastated and we just need to gather together as a family and community and help this poor family. The fire began in the early morning hours. This neighbour saw it engulfing the house and called 911. Oh, it was out of control. It started, in, looked like it started in the back deck. And before you knew it, it was, it was crazy. It was absolutely nuts. RCMP say two families were staying in the home. One was visiting for Canada Day. One man and four children managed to escape, but three adults and four children, two 12-year-olds, an 8-year-old and a 4-year-old, did not make it out. They used to come for, for prayers, you know, because we have a place in Chestermere and in Calgary too. So... It's just like, you know, because everyone knows everyone. This is a small town, small city. And they were very nice people, very nice people, very humble family. The cause of the fire is still under investigation, but RCMP say it's not believed to be criminal in nature. Alison Dempster, CBC News, Calgary. A veteran Toronto police officer was killed in line of duty overnight. Described by police as a deliberate act, Constable Jeffrey Northrup was hit by a vehicle at a city hall parking garage. And late today, a man was charged with first-degree murder. Lorenda Redekop now on what we know about what happened. People are offering their condolences at the downtown division where Constable Jeffrey Northrup worked as his colleagues come to grips with what happened. Constable Northrup was struck by a vehicle. We believe this was an intentional and deliberate act. Overnight, Northrop and its partner were sent to the parking garage underneath Toronto City Hall. The call was initially a robbery, then upgraded to a stabbing. Police say the officers spoke to a man who got in his car and ran them down, killing Constable Northrop, injuring his partner. The loss of a police officer is a searing kind of tragedy for the whole city. Witnesses told us it was a chaotic scene and that the suspect was not alone in his car was like a family and the, I think the husband got arrested and the woman and the child, they were weeping um, and even the, the airbags had gone off. From like the family, like they hit another car from like the rear and uh, the uh, father was getting arrested. The police chief confirmed there were other people in the vehicle, but only one man was arrested. Constable Northrup worked for the Toronto Police Service for 31 years. First as a court officer, he'd recently begun training other officers. He was just a, a full of personality, Jeff, loved by everyone. Uh, just enjoyed coming into work every day, it was his pride and joy. He leaves behind a wife, three children and his mother. I can tell you his family is devastated, the police family is devastated by the senseless act of violence. When I talked with his mother this morning and she said, you know, he died, you know, doing something that he loved. Late today, police announced they charged 31-year-old Umar Zamir with first-degree murder. He'll remain in custody until his next court appearance on July 23rd. Lorenda Radakoff, CBC News, Toronto. 
There's more reaction tonight to the toppling of two statues at the Manitoba legislature following peaceful demonstrations to honor children who died in residential schools. I'm disappointed. I know the intent of all of the organizers involved was to have a peaceful demonstration. I don't think it's helpful um, to, to turn these things into, into violence. Yesterday, Canada Day, a small crowd pulled down the statue of Queen Victoria and a smaller one of Queen Elizabeth. Overnight, the head of Queen Victoria's statue was removed and thrown into a river. The British government has condemned the toppling of the two statues. Buckingham Palace didn't comment. Today, the Prime Minister condemned that kind of vandalism and the arson attacks we've been seeing across the country, much of it targeting churches. Justin Trudeau said help is available to places of worship wanting to increase security. But as another church burned to the ground overnight in B.C., Travis Danra shows us some say getting access to federal help is too complicated. No matter if this is just a building, it's something that means to everybody in this village. Rosalind Daniels and her family could feel the heat on their skin as fire destroyed an Anglican church across the street from their home, a place their community has gathered for over 130 years. When my children seen that, they were just so heartbroken because they have so many memories in that church. The fire on Gitwingak First Nation, the latest in a spate of suspicious fires after multiple unmarked grave sites were discovered at former residential schools. The arson and vandalism being condemned by Indigenous leaders. I can't understand the frustration, the anger and the hurt and the pain, there's no question. Uh, but to burn, burn things down is not our way. Today the Prime Minister said such acts are unacceptable. Burning down churches uh, is actually depriving people who are in need of grieving and healing and mourning uh, from places where they can actually uh, grieve and reflect and look for support. Justin Trudeau also urged churches to access federal funding to help places of worship enhance security. Ottawa added $2 million in this year's budget to that program, originally created in the wake of hate crimes. But some church leaders say accessing the money is slow and difficult. But it, it is a challenge. Some I know that some groups have said, you know what, there's there's so much um, paperwork or administrivia involved in that, I'm, I'm not going to make the application. The tower is on fire now. Back in Gitwingak, Daniels fears lives could be lost if this continues. Aboriginal or not, I don't think anger is the way to deal with it. And we need to sit down and think about what we could do. As that national conversation continues, Ottawa says it has no plans to accelerate the flow of funding from its security infrastructure program, nor simplify the application process. A disappointment to many who want added protection now. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. The Prime Minister is now among the 11 million people in Canada who have received two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Here he is receiving his second one today at an Ottawa pharmacy. And like many other people, he's been mixing his shots. Moderna was today's injection. His first dose back in April was AstraZeneca. So far, all of Canada's vaccinations have been going to those 12 and up because no vaccines are yet approved for anyone younger. And as the country starts to reopen, that leaves plenty of parents asking, what's safe? Here's Vicodopia with families navigating a new world. Here we go. It's been a rough ride for little Ted's parents in the UK. His dad, a Canadian, has been anxious for his son to visit his grandparents back in Ontario. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, when, when we got notification, my wife and I got notification that we were receiving our vaccinations, I cried because it, it just opened the door of being able to see my family again. But Boggs still worries because Ted is too young to be vaccinated and he's unsure of the risk to his own mother who isn't in perfect health. For both my dad and my mom, the first thing they're going to want to do is, is hug him. So we're, we're just going to have to try to manage those situations as best we can. National guidance out last week recommends those who are unvaccinated and vaccinated can gather together indoors in small groups without masks, but still warns immunocompromised people should be careful. Kids will be protected indirectly by having the adults in their world protected. So, for example, they can safely see grandparents who have had both doses of their vaccine uh, because their grandparents are protected anyway. 
As this theater camp prepares to open its doors next week, a priority is assuring parents their unvaccinated children will have minimal close contact with others. It's each camper gets their own, so we've got 1,500 of these. But with school out and kids already mingling, hospitals across Canada are now seeing common colds, coughs and respiratory infections as worried parents bring their kids in to get checked out. It's not a reason to keep them away from camp or to keep them away from socialization. These are things we know how to deal with. These are complications we know how to deal with. Um, so I'm not worried, but I just do warn people that these viruses are on the rise. Ready? Back in England and planning his trip to Canada, Jump. Andrew Boggs vows he'll take every precaution to protect his parents. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. The battle for the Stanley Cup moved to Montreal tonight, but for Habs fans, it wasn't the game they wanted to see. There were some jeers from the crowd inside Bell Centre after the Tampa Bay Lightning beat the Canadians 6-3. Tampa now has a commanding lead in the series, three games to none. And Allison Northcott's not far from Bell Centre in downtown Montreal. I can guess this, Allison, but you tell me, what's the mood like there? Yeah, there are a lot of really disappointed fans here in Montreal tonight. We were at a viewing party that was set up by the city and people had come out tonight with a tremendous amount of excitement and hope that the Habs would be able to turn things around for this series. But now, uh, of course, they are down three games. They've lost three games in a row. So really disappointing and frustrating for fans, a tough game for people to watch. But some fans that we've been speaking with say that they, they're not giving up hope for game four or for the Stanley Cup. They say that they're going to continue to support their team. It looks fairly orderly there. That's a good sign. But of course, the pandemic uh, top of mind in Montreal as officials try to avoid some of those really jammed in street scenes that we saw last uh, home game. How are the crowds being handled for the finals? Well, the city has set up uh, some of these viewing parties where they have the, the game showing on an outdoor screen and people can come to watch. And it's quite uh, tightly controlled. You have to register to attend. There's a limited number of people who uh, can enter the site um, and, and other public health measures that are in place. People are separated into different sections. And that is to give people another option and to avoid those scenes uh, that they were seeing outside of the Bell Centre where the Habs play, which can only accommodate 3,500 people right now because of public health measures after the games a lot of big crowds were, were going down to the bell center and that was raising concern for um, public health authorities there was also another site tonight at the olympic stadium where they were encouraging people because it's a vaccination site as well encouraging people to come uh, get their vaccine their first or their second dose and then stay to watch the game outside on one of those big screens so uh, this will uh, likely continue the next game game four is on monday all right, Allison, thank you so much. You're welcome. A top U.S. track star is apologizing after testing positive for marijuana. Don't judge me because I am human. Next on The National, the suspension that's put her Olympic dreams in jeopardy. Prices at the pump soar just in time for that summer road trip. It doesn't change the actual plans, but it certainly uh, changes the budget. Is there any relief in sight? And the pandemic has changed how couples tie the knot. I'm really grateful that COVID has opened people's eyes to how incredibly amazing small weddings can be. Will this trend stick around in sickness and in health? We're back in two. 22 bodies have now been recovered at the site of the collapsed condo building near Miami. Tragically, one of those victims was the seven-year-old daughter of a City of Miami firefighter. It was truly dif different and more difficult for our first responders. 126 people still unaccounted for, including four Canadians. And new anxiety nearby tonight, not far from the rubble, residents of this other building have been ordered to leave after officials deemed it unsafe. The United States has taken another major step towards ending its longest war. U.S. troops have left the country's main air base in Afghanistan. As Chris Reyes shows us, the end of this era means the beginning of an uncertain one. In 20 years, Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan has never been without U.S. troops. 
Now they've packed up hundreds of cargo planes and left. It's a milestone moment as a decades-long invasion comes to an end. Only about 1,000 U.S. soldiers are left in the country as President Joe Biden moves full force ahead to end his country's longest-running war by September 11. I wanted to make sure there was enough, quote, running room that we could get, wouldn't be able to do it all to September. American soldiers are leaving more than seven years after Canadian forces withdrew in 2014. Right there. Go. Both countries were part of NATO's mission to attack al-Qaeda and overthrow the Taliban after the 9-11 attacks. But even with an Afghan government in place, peace and stability continue to elude the country. Nobody leaves this country um, a victor, a winner. Everyone leaves this country battered, bruised, and in some ways uh, deflated. The pullout comes amid a resurgent Taliban. Some U.S. intelligence reports have predicted the Afghan government could fall as soon as six months after American forces leave for good. We have worked out an over-horizon capacity that we can be value-added, but the Afghans are going to have to be able to do it themselves with the Air Force they have, which you're helping them maintain. A former commander of the Canadian Army who served in Afghanistan, retired Lieutenant General Andrew Leslie, said he understands the decision to end the war, but he doesn't agree with it. I think the future is quite grim, especially for women and girls. I think the Taliban resurgence is, uh, we're just seeing the beginnings of it. Bagram Air Base was once the symbol of America's commitment to Afghanistan. Today, its security is in the hands of Afghan officials. The world has supported us and they will continue to support, but it's only us who can save it. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. U.S. track star Shakari Richardson apologized today after a positive marijuana test led to a one-month suspension, leaving her Olympics in doubt. Here comes Shakari! Richardson's going to Tokyo! 1087! Richardson earned her berth in the Summer Olympics just last week after clocking the fastest 100-meter dash of any American woman ever. But she tested positive for pot at the trials, erasing her result. Today, the 21-year-old said she used marijuana as a coping mechanism after finding out her biological mother had died. So I apologize for the fact that I didn't know how to control my emotions or deal with my emotions during that time. But sitting here, I, I just say, don't judge me because I am human. I'm, I'm you. I just happen to run a little faster. Richardson's suspension ends on July 27th. That means she could still run in the women's relay in Tokyo in August. This will be a tense weekend in communities across B.C. bracing for potential wildfires after watching what happened in Lytton. Oh, my God, look at that. Jesus. We're actually doing, our house is actually doing pretty well, so holy shit, that's fun. Could the extreme conditions that led to devastation this week become the new normal? Why experts say we all need to have an emergency plan. Next on The National. The whole village is going. Escaping the flames with moments to spare. Dramatic scenes from Lytton, British Columbia earlier this week. And there is growing concern about other fires that are burning right now across the province. Many forecasters are looking at this year's fire season with a growing sense of dread. 2021 could be a bad one. This is a province that has been scorched by brutal fire seasons with increasing frequency. Five of the 10 most destructive fire seasons in BC history happened in the last 11 years. Scientists have little doubt climate change is playing a role. So what should we expect in the next few years and how do we prepare communities? Well, let's bring in a couple of scientists to help us tackle these questions. Our own CBC meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff, who's in North Vancouver, and fire ecologist Bob Gray is in Kelowna. Hi to both of you. Hey, Ian. Good afternoon. Uh, Johanna, let me start with you. Uh, you've seen the projections for, for the coming fire season. What might we expect? Well, based on our long-range models, the rest of the summer for the West Coast looking hot and dry, I'm afraid. Uh, usually when we get an early heat setup like this, we've never seen anything like this exactly, uh, heat sort of begets heat. So uh, looking hot for the next couple of months, I'm afraid. And with that heat, is it inevitably there'll be more wildfires or would we, is it likely we'd get more wildfires? 
it's still a function of ignitions. And we can certainly have a, the setup for very hot, dry conditions, but it still comes down to whether or not we get the fire starts, the ignitions. That's the key. Here's a question I'm going to put to both of you, and, and Bob, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you first. Uh, we hear this term new normal, and, and there are people who wonder if, you know, all the haze that we've been seeing here in British Columbia during wildfire season, the number of fires, is that the new normal? We're likely going to see conditions like this not every single summer, but the majority of summers going forward. As far as the normal, conditions are going to continue to change, and in some cases, they'll get much worse. So, so something's, to, to normalize, you have to sort of stabilize things, and that's really not what's going to happen in the future. And Joe, jump in on that. Yeah, well, I'm actually going to quote Bob. I've heard him say this before. <laughs> in the future, there is no no smoke option. It's how do we want our smoke? You know, we're going to get it from the south. We're going to get it on our big wildfire years, and we're going to need to get it uh, during prescribed burning. So a smoky future indeed in the cards. Okay, so a lot of people yeah. who are watching this are in places like British Columbia and Alberta, and they're wondering about fire season, and they're wondering, Bob, what can be done to better protect communities? Do you have some suggestions? Well, we have to start treating landscapes. Uh, it, it, the broad scale approach to things, we, so far our focus has been on rating close to communities within a kilometer or so, but yeah, that's the physical threat to communities. But when it comes to the smoke, like we've been talking about, uh, we have to start going very much broader scale um, um, out as far as 5, 10, 15, 20 kilometers in cases. These fires are making runs of significant distances in very short periods of time. Kenow in 2017 in Waterton did a 17K run overnight. So we have to be thinking of broad, broad landscapes. You know, Johanna, I, I think about the models of, of rising water and I've seen documentaries about communities where they say, you know, 10, 15, 20 years out, it might not be good to have residential areas mm -hmm. right on the edge of the water. What about in terms of forest fires? Are there places in BC and Alberta where people just won't be able to live anymore because of the encroaching fires? Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question. And I think that's probably a very real reality in the near future. I mean, uh, the heat really was the setup for the unprecedented wildfires we're already seeing. And, you know, we had to get out of our own home here in North Vancouver. I couldn't stay in my own home because the heat was too dangerous. So I think in the very near future, there will be times of the year where people think about getting out already. British Columbians don't even plan a camping trip for late summer because all the smoke season and the fire season have ramped up in the past few decades. So I think communities are going to start thinking about that change very, very soon. And, and Johanna, what about the link between climate change and specifically what we've seen in mm. British Columbia over the last week? Uh, what would the answer be to that? Uh, you know, unequivocally, their climate change is behind the unprecedented events that we're seeing. You know, the atmospheric records are being rewritten in front of our very eyes. The heat wave uh, that led up to this, uh, something that meteorologists didn't expect to see this earlier in this early in the summer, this early in the decade. And I think the question now is just how much did climate change uh, play a role? And I know scientists are going to be running those models trying to figure out you know, was it a 30% increase that these events will happen again? It's a non-linear connection, though. It's not just that we're seeing shifting baselines. It's the changes to jet stream, to ocean temperatures. It's a, it's a complicated formula, but one that scientists can work out, and the connection is there. So, Bob, a complicated formula and some pretty big forces at play here in terms of getting mm -hmm. the heat up. What about pushing back? What can we, what should we do as a, you know, as a country, as a government, to deal with this? Uh, the only thing that we can really control, we can't control the weather, you know, that with the, what occurs during fire season, and we can't really control where they start, but we can control what burns. We can control the fuel, the vegetation, the biomass, and we're talking millions of tons of material, but we have to find a solution for it. Uh, and we're going to have to look at how we mar market this material and how we create markets for them in the future, but it comes down to basically managing how much is available to burn. That is the driver for smoke. That's the driver for total fire cost. That's the driver for uh, particulate matter and smoke effects on human health. So that's really what we have to focus on is removing massive quantities of fuel. And Johanna, we have about 30 seconds. How about last word to you? It's going to be a busy season ahead. And, I, and speaking to other forecasters, I think uh, the takeaway is start your emergency plan for the summer ahead, uh, no matter where you are in the province, no matter where you are in the country, because, uh, you know, climate change is ramping things up a lot sooner than we thought. Johanna, Bob, really nice uh, speaking to you this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Ian.
Some of these concerns could quickly be moving across the country as this unprecedented heat dome continues to move. Last weekend, it was mainly bearing down on British Columbia, but heat warnings now stretch through the prairies into Ontario and north to parts of the territories. That prolonged, intense heat has led to scenes like this on BC's Mount Waddington, more than 2,500 metres above sea level, the snow disappearing in a matter of days. In Canada's north, it's another type of melt that has experts worried. As Deanna Sumanag-Johnson shows us, it could accelerate climate change at an alarming rate. As Canada's northwest is fighting fires and floods, researchers like Fabrice Calme are keeping a watchful eye on the ground. It's a raise the temperature of permafrost, and uh, that's never good because uh, with a cumulative effect, permafrost will, uh, will thaw. Permafrost is ground that remains frozen for at least two years. The short-term damage of it thawing is the first concern. It's still happening because all these trees are leaning here. It's something scientists and indigenous elders in the north have been ringing alarm bells about for years. This week, with Northwest Territories reaching its hottest day on record, a scorching 39.9 degrees in Fort Smith brought new urgency. If you've built a house in a region where you thought the permafrost was stable, now it's starting to melt. Of course, you get problems with, you know, uh, buildings moving and things like pipeline shifting. It can also cause landslides. But it's the long-term impact of melting permafrost that's even more concerning to scientists. Permafrost stores large amounts of carbon, and it has stored this carbon for thousands of years. But as the permafrost thaws, uh, this carbon is released into the atmosphere, which exacerbates global warming even, even, even further. Researchers say the extent of the damage this heat wave has exacted on Canada's permafrost will only become known as the summer progresses. But they all say it's yet another reason for governments to take climate change seriously before things get even worse. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, if you're planning a summer road trip, your wallet should brace for impact. Gas prices are soaring and there's no sign they'll be coming down anytime soon. We'll explain why after the break. As Canadians emerge from COVID lockdowns, many are planning a summer road trip, but along with the GPS and sunscreen, they'd be wise to budget something extra to fill the tank. Gas prices are soaring. Business reporter Kyle Bax explains why. Many summer road trips are beginning with a hit to the wallet filling up the tank at sky-high prices. It doesn't change the actual plans, but it certainly uh, changes the budget. Expensive, but uh, what I can to do? Nothing. Pump prices are at a four-year high and climbing. It's just like breaking the bank for sure. Those hefty prices are one reason why there's renewed optimism in the Western Canadian oil fields. After seven long years and a downturn, the oil patch is thriving. I haven't been this bullish on Canadian energy for a lot of years, and I think we're coming back and it feels good. With an upswing in drilling activity, some companies are even having to compete for manpower. There are plenty of rigs ready to be put to work, but not as many available crews. People have left the province, um, really hard to attract them back. I've heard multiple times that it feels as though we're on a cusp of a boom. We have all the, all the symptoms of it. Gasoline prices are rising as oil prices are climbing too up more than 50% since just the beginning of the year, as economies rev up and COVID restrictions wind down. And oil prices could climb further, especially as other types of travel continue to take off. The last big thing that we're waiting for is jet fuel uh, demand to start uh, resuming. I know myself and my family cannot wait to get on a plane and go somewhere anywhere right now. So I'm sure that that pent up demand is going to manifest itself very soon, but it hasn't yet. He says with oil prices expected to keep climbing through the summer, Canadians shouldn't expect any relief at the pumps anytime soon. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. Just ahead, the COVID workaround that just might stick around after the pandemic. I'm really grateful that COVID has opened people's eyes to how incredibly amazing small weddings can be. Will couples still say I do to the tiny, perfect ceremony? We have opinions from both sides of the aisle.
I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Another industry ramping up as COVID winds down is the business of planning weddings. During the pandemic, the micro celebration was the answer for many couples. Tiny, personal, affordable. But will they get squeezed out as social gatherings get bigger? As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, opinions are split down the aisle. This is where Lisiane Morris planned to marry her Canadian fiance, a castle back home in France. It's a tradition. It just makes it more fancy and more magical. But the prospect of saying her vows in front of 120 family and friends was stressful. So when the pandemic put a halt on international travel, Morris was actually relieved. This was a perfect opportunity for us to have an excuse not to do it in a big way. This was plan B, a wedding on a local farm in British Columbia with just four guests. I'm really grateful that COVID has opened people's eyes to how incredibly amazing small weddings can be. In Toronto, the founder of the pop-up Chapel Co says demand for small ceremonies more special than City Hall for less money than a traditional wedding was already growing before COVID and now it's ramping up even more. This year we should marry over 150 couples in our chapels across Canada and I'm just like ready to get the ball rolling and to do events again. For others, small services have been more of a survival strategy. Most venues and vendors have come up with new packages that they never had before. But for an industry hard hit, going from 120 person weddings like this to this means earning far less money on food and drinks. We're allowing for smaller weddings because it's the only thing that couples have the option to do. But in the future, um, we do need to see bigger weddings in order for the business to continue. This wedding planner was supposed to do 47 weddings in 2020. Instead, just eight small ceremonies went ahead. Our wedding industry definitely took a really big hit, specifically the South Asian wedding industry, because, I mean, we never even heard about the term micro wedding. She expects large multi-day celebrations to return next year. All the weddings that we have for 2022 are uh, at least, if not more, 250 people and above when all options, big and small, can be on the table. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Next, a moment of bravery and resilience in the face of disaster. As wildfires ripped through their village this week, one couple drove into the flames in hopes of rescuing others. Their story is next. A glimpse of the terrifying moments earlier this week as wildfires closed in on Lytton, B.C. and residents were forced to flee in a matter of minutes. When the flames broke out, Trisha Thorpe and Donald Glasgow jumped into the school bus that he drives to help get people and animals in the community out. Their bravery and determination to rebuild is tonight's moment. We got a call from Stein Valley. I drive really fast once in a while and they asked to drive bus to help pick up some batteries. And of course, they responded instantly. I got the wife to drive me over there. And by the time I got the bus and came back, the whole town was on fire just that quick. I was thinking, OK, I got to get home really quick and try and bundle up what I can or, you know, as many animals as I could. My cats were in the house. A couple of the animals were locked in pens. We couldn't do anything. We were helpless. So my goal right now is to get my my animals out of there. A ranch that's further up the valley was able to get in with three horse trailers and get animals out. I want to know who's there. I want to look after them. I just want to take care of them and I want to get in there and get get them out safe. And you can either let this destroy you or you can do your darndest to, to try and find the silver linings and keep going because you can't let it bury you. Like my father used to say, if you're this far down, there's only one way to go and that's up. So. You know, that is a classic moment for our program. Often in the news, you hear about things that are dysfunctional, people who do bad things, and then, you know, viewers kind of despair for, uh, you know, human nature. Why do people do bad things? But on the moment, you see how many people, whether it's a flood or a wildfire or some other calamity, just jump in and help out, as did they. So perfect way to end the week. That is the National for July the 2nd. I hope you can join me on Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 Pacific, and then later that evening back here on the National. 
少ない。